you want people to be in the office more frequently. And, and I, I honestly think that mandating everybody to be there five days a week during certain hours is a big mistake because they're just going to look for someplace else to work. But if you want to draw them into the office, make it a magnet, make, make there be a reason for them to be there. You know, if you want people in the office twice a week for meetings and so that they can collaborate with, with uh, other people, make sure it's, it's a meaningful experience and, and it's going to be worth their time and effort to get there. If, if, most, if most of your workforce is fairly close by, you know, not, not out in, you know, remote areas around the country, you can do some fun things on occasion, um, you know. Good morning, everybody. You are listening to Money Matters. Today on Money Matters, we're diving deep into the art and science of exceptional leadership with two trailblazers in the field of human resources and management, Barbara Mitchell and Cornelia Gamlin. Cornelia, a returning guest. Cornelia, welcome back. Thank you, Chris. Alongside Barbara, we'll share insights from their latest triumph, The Decisive Manager. Get results, build morale, and the boss your people deserve. Rated an outstanding five out of five stars on Amazon. This book is heralded as a must read for managers striving to navigate the complex terrain of modern workplace dynamics. Whether you're wrestling with people issues, looking to hire top talent, or aiming to create a culture of growth and development, today's episode is packed with practical advice directly from the experts. Get ready for an enlightening discussion that promises to transform the way that you lead. Stay tuned as we uncover the secrets to becoming the decisive manager your team not only needs but deserves. And I just wanted to let listeners know to remember, you don't want to miss a single moment of today's episode. Stick with us until the very end, because Barbara and Cornelia will be sharing exclusive tips not found in their book, The Decisive Manager. Plus, we have a special segment where they'll answer the burning question, how can managers effectively lead in the ever-evolving landscape of remote and hybrid work? Make sure to listen through to the end for insights that could be the game changer in your leadership journey. Let's unlock the full potential of effective management together right here. Once again, Cornelia, thank you for joining the show. Barbara, thanks for, for joining us today. What what I'd like to start with and kind of just dive right into it is this, that initial spark. What initially inspired you to write The Decisive Manager? Well, one of the things that, that we had talked about when we first had the idea for this book was we've written other books in the past. We wrote one called The Manager's Answer Book, and it really covered the whole spectrum of management. And we, you know, since then, we had written some more. And we updated our first book, The Big Book of HR. And we realized there's probably a need out there for managers to have their questions answered exclusively around some of those people management issues. So that, that was really how we started down this path of the decisive manager. And then the world changed with so much remote work and so much, so much new information that we felt that it was really appropriate for us to dive in to this topic exclusively on how to how to manage people in our crazy new world. I love it. And and you know, Cornelia, when we originally talked, that was I was in quarantine. So our I may have yeah. been at the office, but that was when everybody was was just kind of started remote working there. So I've got my copy here of the decisive manager. This is the new one. I got, you know, everybody doesn't get a book book bookmark. Oh. I got my bookmark here. Uh, this is a subject that is is really close to my heart. You know, I'm a financial advisor, but I was a corporate trainer at one point. And yeah. and as a business owner for the last 20 years. I've been a manager. I've had to wear an HR hat. It's often difficult for managers and leaders to shift, you know, shift that role. And so this is a huge, huge area for people. Can you share a specific example or maybe a case study from the book that illustrates a common managerial challenge and how your advice can address that? Well, I think, first of all, I would start out with the fact that you have to have the right people in order to to run an organization. And I think that's a piece that many managers forget about. You're a, you're a money guy, Chris, and we've got to have, the money's got to be there. And, and 
pay all those bills and do all the things that money does for us. But without the right people in the right organization, it really doesn't matter what else you do. And so we spend a great deal of time. And in fact, our, our first section is about the employee experience. How do you get the right people? How do you keep the right people? How do you utilize the right people in, in whatever environment that you have? So it all starts from there. And then we take it in you know, many directions. In the HR world, there are certainly other things that are important, but there's nothing more important than having the right people. Absolutely. I know, Cornelia, when you were on the show before, we talked a, a bit about this as well, about cultivating talent. Uh, you mentioned, you know, having the, Barbara mentioned having the right people, keeping the right people. Each one, you could do a whole book just on these one. Each one of these topics, hugely important. Cornelia, could you talk a little bit about cultivating talent uh, for us? Sure. You know, one of the things we, we talk about in probably most of our books is the importance of once you bring people into your organization, making sure that they stay current in, in the role that you initially hire them for, but then also recognizing that they're not gonna be happy just being in that same role for forever and ever and ever. If you wanna keep good people in the organization, you have to make sure that they update their skills and that you're preparing them for other challenges within the organization. You're preparing them for growth. And you know, a lot of people will cringe when you start talking about training, as I'm sure you know from being a corporate trainer. But in this day and age, there are so many resources for people to, to turn to that are not terribly expensive, that can fit into the budget of an organization of any size. I mean, there, there are, I've joked that you could sit and, and look, look at a webinar every day. You could probably look at several of them every day. Um, you know, there, there are YouTube videos out there that, you know, if you, especially if you're looking for specific skills, they can show people how to do something. Um, you know, there, there's readings that people can do. There are podcasts that people can listen to. So there are, there are a lot of cost-effective ways to keep people engaged and, and to keep them moving. But, you know, I, I also think exposing them to things within your organization and doing some on-the-job training is also very, very critically important. That sends such a powerful message that, that the organization cares about them. And if they know that, they're, they're not going to go looking for someplace else to work. Very important points that you made there. Uh, you started by saying staying current. So that's always a challenge. There's always roadblocks that come up to that. Uh, you talked about training and how valuable that is. We live in a world today where it could be as easy as somebody watching a, a YouTube video or it could be a webinar. There's many different facets. I remember when I was a trainer, it's always kind of an arm wrestle with the CFO of the company and the HR department as to uh -huh. why it's valuable for our soft skill stuff. And yet this is such an important piece of, of the company and, and what you do. So really, really good information there. Barbara, I'd like to come back to you because one of the things you mentioned earlier, you talked about employee experience, and that's actually a big topic in the book, uh, The Decisive Manager. How does the decisive manager advise managers to create a positive and engaging employee experience, particularly in the context of retention and motivation? Well, it all starts in the hiring process well before you even meet the employee, potential employee. I think many, many managers don't think about the fact that uh, if, if you post a job, for example, uh, the, empl the prospective employee is going to go on your website, check you out. What's your culture like? What is it? What are your challenges? They spend a great deal of time researching before they even decide to apply. And so that's, that's something that managers need to really be aware of and not miss an opportunity to sell a prospective employee before they even apply. Then they apply, you wanna make sure that your hiring process is smooth. It doesn't make them go through 8,720 different <laughs> uh, steps. I may be exaggerating a little bit. Uh, <laughs> no, that's about it, right. I think. <laughs> I think in many organizations, yes. Make it as easy as possible. Make them want to, Come work for you 
I don't make them think, oh, if this is what it's like before I'm hired, I don't want to work there. So your hiring process, it's where it all begins. And then after you make the offer, which of course is a huge part of this, then you've got the very critical onboarding process. How do you bring the person in? How do you get them into your culture? How do you get them to know the people that are already in the organization? How do you share what, what your values are? And of course, that what your values are starts on your website as well. They're for sure they ought to be there. They ought to be there in depth so that somebody reading it should say, you know, this is an organization that really links with what I want to accomplish. Today's employees are not just interested, and I don't mean this literally, not just interested in a paycheck. They want to work somewhere where they feel proud. They want to work somewhere where they where they the work that they do makes a difference. And so anything you can do to give them those those opportunities is what's going to get them to apply, to accept the job once you offer it to them. And then you bring them on board and you make make sure that they get right into your culture and they get excited. You want, you want your new hire to go home that first night and say, huh, I made a really good decision because people make choices very early on. There's research that shows people make very quick decisions on if their first day doesn't go well, uh, you are behind already. Uh, so make sure your first day goes well, make it as fun as you can. And I know it's getting harder and harder because of uh, remote work, but it's not impossible. We've got some great ways in, in the book and we can talk about those if if you'd like at some point. Uh, but yeah, I think absolutely. the employee experience is, is everything about who they are when they are at work uh, and how, you're, how they're treated, how they feel, how they wanna talk about, they wanna tell their friends, I'm really working for this great company may not be a household word, that doesn't matter. We do really good work. We're making a difference. I'm proud to be there. I love that. A lot of really good information there. Uh, you talked about, you know, right at the beginning, the hiring process, giving a good experience. If you make it super complicated and kind of like jumping through hurdles, uh, that's not a good experience for, for people coming on board there. The very important offer, making the offer, being consistent, uh, bringing the corporate culture and the values into the process early on when you're doing the onboarding process. How do we keep that momentum going and kind of front load that positive experience? Very, very important information for people who are, who are in that role of hiring, whether it's the HR person, whether it's the manager, both of them, these are super important things. And then absolutely for sure, we will continue our conversation on managing remote teams because Cornelia and me started that <laughs> when we were right right, right at the yeah. beginning of, of, uh, of COVID. And what was funny is because when I listened, I went back and listened to that show, uh, you guys did the 10 year anniversary of the big book of HR. And one of the things that we talked about then was working remotely. And we said, well, we don't, you know, 10 years later, when we're looking at this, we don't want people to be caught with the, and it turns out uh, the remote working stuff, this is not going away. <laughs> this is, this is a very important uh, thing. So, so, so let me put it this way with the shift towards remote and hybrid work, what key strategies do you suggest in the decisive manager for managers to maintain team cohesion and performance? You know, what, one of the big discussions that we're seeing these days is um, people not wanting to come back to the office and the mandates that, you know, if, if you live in, in the vicinity, you know, in the geographic vicinity of where the, the company is located, you have to come into the office and you know people are kind of shunning that and saying wait a minute why i can be just as effective being at home um why do i have to go into the office five days a week why do i have to deal with traffic if you live in a large metro area and and all of that you know if you want people to be in the office more frequently and and i i honestly think that mandating everybody to be there five days a week 
during certain hours is a big mistake because they're just going to look for someplace else to work. But if you want to draw them into the office, make it a magnet, make, make there be a reason for them to be there. You know, if you want people in the office twice a week for meetings and so that they can collaborate with, with other people, make sure it's, it's a meaningful experience and, and it's going to be worth their time and effort to get there. If most of your workforce is fairly close by, you know, not not out in you know remote areas around the country, you can do some fun things on occasion. Um, you know, have a plan to have some kind of a party or a, an ice cream social in, in the afternoon so that they'll stick around for something like that. You know, with uh, with the upcoming March Madness season, plan to have tailgate parties in the cafeteria. So, you know, so people can kind of get into more of a festive mood. But, you know, even beyond that, make sure that they're not coming in for meetings that are just dull and boring and where nothing is getting accomplished. You know, plan things out accordingly so that, that they feel like they're, they're making a contribution when they're there and that their time in the office is valuable. But, you know, also don't forget some of the time that they spend you know, working from home alone where they can be more focused and concentrated can really help their productivity and, and help the organization. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Barbara, do you have anything to add to that as well? I think making the time that's in the office really productive I, so that I, I keep hearing about organizations that call people into the office, say, two days a week and then they have meetings on those two days, but everybody's not there on the same two days. So then they still do their meetings on Zoom. And so why would I drive into the office when I live in Washington, D.C., where traffic is hideous, uh, as I know Houston is as well. 100%. Uh, it, yeah, there's, there's no way I want to go make that effort and then still have a meeting on Zoom. What's the point? Uh, and so really thinking through how you how you bring people together. I think, Cornelia mentioned the word fun. Fun is not a four-letter word. It's a great three-letter word that, that managers should really embrace. Uh, and I'm thinking things like uh, food. If you're gonna bring people into the office, make sure that there's something, there's some reason for them to come in and make it make it some sort of fun that whether it's a the company brings in bagels or whatever it is but make it so that that they know that you've thought about them, that you have put some effort into the fact that being there is is important and here's the reasons why uh but don't make them come in and then just behave as if they're sitting in their in their home office uh, doing the same thing they would be normally what is the point? You know, we can dull meetings, right? <laughs> Get, getting a rid of dull meetings just for the purpose to have these these same meetings over and over. So making sure that when we're there, we're we're having the most impact. You mentioned things like you know having fun, just bringing food in, the tailgating, the we've got March Madness, all of that stuff coming up. Things that we could put events around and and just make it fun when we when we do have people in the office. You know, I want to applaud y'all for including that in the decisive manager because you know me and my wife were talking about this she got her mba you know in the last five years prior to covid and uh, we had a discussion about how this is really a leadership crisis we've got the ceos who are not a hundred percent on board because they just don't trust whether, whether people are working and doing you know because they're used to one model they're used to the ways that it's done and we've got personality types that actually function better when they're able to focus focus and not be interrupted throughout the day. And so that doesn't necessarily co compute there. And so for managers and leaders, there's the challenge that this is stuff that we, when we were getting our MBAs, it wasn't on their new territory that we're heading into. So I love the fact that in the book, The Decisive Manager, you guys have updated that and you've brought this discussion and this debate, not only forward, but you're giving us practical tips on how to, to work with this as leaders and as managers. Uh, really, really good stuff there. We've got about 10 minutes before the end of the show. Let's talk about 
what we just talked about, adapting to change. <laughs> uh, yeah. Given the rapid changes that we come into in the workplace, how does your book guide managers in staying adaptable and resilient while leading their teams? Well, I think one thing is taking care of yourself as a manager. I think uh, we've got to do better at uh, making sure that we're all taking care of ourselves. Self-care is so critical, uh, and the, the world is so c complicated, uh, and making sure that we're getting you know, enough sleep, eating right, getting enough exercise, doing all the things that can make you a good person and therefore can make you a good manager. can't have one without the other, I don't think. Uh, but then it's it's some very, very, very basic managerial skills. Cornelia is probably fascinated that it's taken me this long to mention my usual favorite word here, and that is uh, being a good listener. Uh, managers just have to better and better and better at listening to their employees and not just, to, not just as you said, Chris, a moment ago, expecting that this is the way it's always been, this is the way it's always going to be. No. Uh, we need to know what, what's on your mind. How are you today? Uh, what we learned, I think one of the things we learned so emphatically during COVID was managers who made those phone calls, their employees, one by one by one by one, and just said, how are you doing? Are you okay? Uh, when we were all separated. That is a it doesn't that's not a COVID kind of a skill, that's not a pandemic kind of a skill. That is a very, very, very strong good management skill. And not enough managers pay attention to it. So being a good listener is hugely important in making this new world work. I would say regarding the book, one of the things that as we were planning it out, we realized because there were so many things that were changing. You know, we, we kind of ran into that when we were writing the Big Book of HR, as you mentioned. But, you know, fast forward a year and we were saying, okay, now we know what some of these challenges really are. And so we made sure that in every section we had like a subsection about navigating the new workplace because it it has changed, it is continuing to change and as you said earlier, Chris, it, we're just not going back to the way things were, even though some people, I think, would like to do that. Well, let's. I did tell the listeners that we would talk about one thing outside of the book, and I, I don't think this is in here, but do you guys have any thoughts about artificial intelligence, AI, and its applications as a worker? Should we be worried? Should we reskill? What? Where does that fall? I think all of the above is probably appropriate. Uh, I don't think we can put our heads in the sand and say it's going to go away. It's not. Uh, and so what what can we learn from it? How can we use it? And there are some very pr uh, practical ways that we can we can use it. Uh, I think being not being afraid of it, uh, like any this is this is one of the biggest, I think, in thinking in in my lifetime of changes that we've had to face as a as a world. So let's uh, let's not uh, make ourselves uh, you know paranoid about it. Let's say okay, how can we use it? What are the ways we can use it? How can I learn about it? I mean I just this morning turned on my computer and something popped up and said you you want to you want to try AI on this. And I thought, oh, I I don't know. <laughs> right, maybe I right. do. Maybe I maybe I do. Uh, and at the moment, I knew I knew where I was headed with it. I didn't feel like I needed, but I, it might be something that I would say, yeah, help me. So I, th I think uh, we're going to all learn together and it's going to be uh, exciting. But like any other change, uh, there are people that adapt to change. There are, and there are people that fight it. There are people that uh, will never get to it. And I'm sus I suspect they'll be the ones left behind. Very, yeah. very good uh, information. Cornelia, thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say I agree. I mean, I, I know like in, in the world of writing and, um, you know, there have been a lot of authors who have already starting to get burned by AI with, with AI coming along and, you know, stealing their work or, or taking portions of their work you know, without permission. 
and and I can certainly see that you know that that side of the equation. Um, you know, even in talking to our agent one time, she said, you know, you sign a contract and and you are um, you're basically stating that you're going to submit original work. And how do we know that an author is not submitting something that's AI generated? But you know, having said that, I I think like everything else, it's don't look at it as a substitute, but look at it as a tool that can help you. You know, if you're um, you know if, if you're writing something, you know, whether it's in the business world or, or, or as a writer, you know, if you sometimes, you know, we all get writer's block. I mean, pulling something up on AI will spur an idea. It doesn't mean you have to use verbatim what they've written, but it gives you an idea of, oh, maybe I can rephrase that. Or, yeah, that's kind of where I wanted to go with that, that particular thought. Um, you know, and I think the other thing is to be cautious and say, be able to spot some of this stuff. And I know Barbara and I have talked about, you know, get, getting these blind messages from people and, and you start reading it and going, huh? And, you know, and a couple of times I, I, in, the be, in the beginning of, of the emergence of, of, of AI, I'd go, that's really stupid. And then I'd go, oh, <laughs> wait a minute. I didn't catch anything that that was AI generated. Nobody talks like that. Nobody writes like that. So, you know, um, you can use it as a very, very valuable tool, um, but but still make it authentic, make it your own if, if it's if it's ideas that you're looking for. And then sometimes it's great ideas too that you can just find through AI. Yeah. I know uh, Cornelia, we talked about for, I would encourage listeners to go back to our first episode because we talked a little bit more about your writing process because I'm always fascinated when I talk to authors about the writing process. So you you can tune into that one and, and we'll do a, a more or you'll hear a little bit more about that. We've got just two minutes before the show's over. So, so um, let me see what I'd like to end with. You know, one of the things y'all talk about is feedback and growth. What role does constructive feedback play in employee development? And I'm going to be bad because I'm only going to give you about two minutes to answer that. Uh, so concise. <laughs> I think it's critical, um, but you have to learn how to do it right. You have to be able to give that that feedback constructively in a way that it makes the employee feel positive about themselves. That that you're not you're not looking to to ding them on something. You're not looking to point out what they've done horribly, but it's, let's see what we can learn from this experience. How could you have done it better? Barbara, thoughts on that as well? Well, I, I like the idea of being future focused on feedback. It's not what you've done wrong uh, in, in, in the past. It's what, what you can do and how you can do more of it. And that changes everything when you're talking about moving somebody from a place that they could be a little bit better, give them a little encouragement and see how they can fly. And most people will respond. Book, The Decisive Manager. Um, we are right here at the tail end here. Uh, Cornelia, Barbara, is there anything that I forgot to ask you that you'd like to leave listeners with today? I think maybe you were to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> For more information, you know, they can go to our website, um, bigbookofhr.com, and they'll find information on all of our books, and there's links to where they can buy it. So we, we certainly hope that they'll take advantage of that. Absolutely. And if you're driving while you're listening to this, we're going to have that link in the podcast notes as well. Barbara Cornelia, thank you so much for being on the show today. Have a good rest of the day there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. It's been a delight.